Well, thanks, Marcia. Thanks for having me, I guess, back after a few years. So to answer your question, uh, Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership, I believe it really started around 2014 as the Maryland Bird Conservation Initiative. Uh, I, I started working with the program in 2016 and then came on as the executive director a year later. And we are coming up on two years as a nonprofit now. So yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of good stuff is going on. And uh, let me let me get a screen share going. And you know, I guess if um, if anybody has questions during, I'm okay with. Um, Marsh, if there's a chat or something, if we count. people want to interrupt, okay, where I want to make sure I've got several external screens, <laughs> so I want to make sure I get the right one up there. Uh, so you should be seeing my presentation right now. Yes. Okay. And just that and not the uh, notes or anything, right? Correct. All right, good, good, good. Okay. Um, yeah, one of our relatively new programs, um, actually a couple of them, uh, the Farmland Raptor Program and the Chimney Swift Conservation Program. Um, so you see, we, we can kind of retool Smokey Bear to, instead of the shovel, he's putting up kestrel boxes for us now. So this is a program that we are hoping to engage bird clubs um, like you guys in helping us out to make uh, conservation for these farmland raptors and chimney swifts happen. Maribor Conservation Partnership's mission focuses on native wild bird populations and habitats along with partnerships with both public and private organizations, as well as engaging communities and community people. We, en we envision a Maryland landscape that is healthy and sustainable, not just for birds, but also for communities and the people who live in those communities. And we strive to connect birds, habitat, and people throughout Maryland which I think during the pandemic is happening a lot more easily than in previous years as people are rediscovering their connection with nature, thankfully. I wanna give a quick, quick synopsis of a paper that came out in Science, uh, the journal Science in October of 2019 that highlighted the fact that since 1970, we have lost 2.9 billion birds from the breeding population in North America. That's basically, well, more than one in four, it's, it's actually getting close to one in three birds, but it's a, it's a lot of uh, birds that we have lost. Um, that was assuming a starting point of 10 billion birds. And I know the people who go through these um, calculations and modeling and do all the stuff to estimate bird populations, um, and it, it is quite a process they go through. And I think the accuracy of what they come up with is pretty good. Uh, so the estimate has been we've gone from 10 billion birds to just over 7 billion in the breeding population. And most groups of birds uh, have suffered declines. Aerial insectivores um, have lost a total of 32% as a group and some of the species to highlight there, uh, the barn swallow, uh, down 40%, common nighthawk, 58%, chuckwill's widow, eastern whippoorwill, uh, more than 60%, and then chimney swifts are down 67%. Grassland birds have taken a huge hit of more than half lost since 1970, and Probably one of the more surprising facts, I think, is that we've lost 75% of eastern meadowlarks from the breeding population in the last 50 years. 
migratory birds as a group, those birds that breed here and then migrate in the non-breeding season to Central and South America and the Caribbean, are down by 30%. Uh, those of you that go birding around here, which I'm sure is all of you, probably have noticed a drop in Baltimore Oriole populations. We've lost pretty much two in five of those. However, the news isn't all bad. Um, due to conservation efforts, um, the recovery from DDT, we have increased raptor populations by 15 million birds. So there are good things to look at and hopefully these are things that we can be working towards for those other groups of birds. So one thing we need to look at is just what's killing North American's birds. And um, this is a, a, a conservative estimate uh, from a paper that Scott Loss and, and others had done uh, back in 2015. Um, cats, those are both uh, feral and domestic, so basically free-ranging cats, are the number one cause of uh, human-caused uh, source of mortality for birds. Windows are probably, and collisions in general with buildings, uh, probably closer to a billion birds by now. Uh, there are vehicles and industrial collisions. Along with that paper, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology took the lead on producing seven simple actions to help birds. Um, and this is something that uh, Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership through its various programs we're, we're pretty much working with all seven of these actions. Tonight, what I'm gonna talk about really falls under this uh, do community science, uh, which also is called citizen science, but it's sort of evolving into community science. So I just wanna look at how, very quickly, how do we assess bird populations? Uh, there are a number of things, there's an atlas, and a breeding bird atlas basically looks at the distribution and relative abundance of bird populations, whatever geographic entity is being counted, such as the state, um, sometimes a county. Um, San Diego County, in fact, has done their own atlas. Um, they have had 496 confirmed species breeding in San Diego County. Uh, the first or the second Maryland DC breeding bird atlas had 206, uh, and that's probably not surprising. But basically for the third iteration of this breeding bird atlas, we have completed one field season. We are now starting early in the second one. Um, raptors and some owls are actually starting that process right now. And if you haven't participated in the atlas, I will put in a plug to become engaged and help out. Uh, make your birding worth something to the conservation efforts. The uh, third breeding bird atlas uses eBird as the uh, data entry platform. And this is um, some stats from late last year, pretty much, I guess, summarizing the uh, most of the first field season. Uh, so we can see the confirmed species. PG County is seventh out of the uh, counties. Um, Garrett County, um, surprisingly to me at least, has the highest number of confirmed breeding species. So if you get onto that eBird platform, uh, eBird.org, and look at that uh, Atlas, you can look at all kinds of information, which is really, to me, really fascinating and up to the minute, which is which is a great thing. Um, so let me launch into the Maryland Farmland Raptor Program. Um, this is something that uh, the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership is working with a few other groups to essentially provide state level coordination or facilitation. There are a number of efforts that are ongoing uh, in different areas, uh, and we just wanted to have a way where all these different efforts are working toward the same end, collecting data in the same manner, entering these data into the same um, platform so they can be analyzed uh, as a statewide uh, database. Um, 
Yeah, let me just back up. So the four species, uh, you can see there, kestrels, barn owls are the two main ones we're looking at, uh, but it also includes northern harrier and short-eared owl. So I'll start with uh, some overview of American kestrel. And one thing when I'm doing these in, in these programs in person, um, I generally like to do a little pop quiz. So it's going to be hard. It's kind of hard to do that over Zoom, but uh, the quiz is um, the scientific name for Kestrel, Falcos sparvarius. Um, who knows what that means? And I can't really see any hands or anything, but um, the genus name Falco comes from the Latin F-A-L-X, false, which means a sickle probably referring to either the long pointed scythe like wings in flight or the falcate or hooked bill uh, and curved talons, perhaps all three of these things. A specific name, the species name Sparbarius means literally pertaining to a sparrow, referring to the bird's small size. And sometimes you've probably heard this bird called the sparrow hawk, probably for good reason. This map is from uh, Birds of the World. Um, and actually they have done a number of these. I think virtually all the breeding species in North America have taken um, many, many years of eBird data now, run it through uh, a model to predict um, or to show the relative abundance throughout the year. And these are animated models which I think provide just a fascinating way to see distribution and abundance and, and really um, uh, a map of breeding and non-breeding distributions. So as I started here, you can see from the beginning of the year where kestrel distributions go, beginning October, November, December, and we'll run it one more time. And you can see for the most part, kestrels do some migration in North America, not long distance migration. And in South America, we have essentially mostly resident populations uh, in South America. There are uh, as many as 17 recognized subspecies of American kestrel uh, from Alaska all the way down to the tip of Tierra del Fuego. If you want information about nest boxes and some other interesting things, um, there's the All About Bird site, but under Nest Watch, there's also All About Bird Houses. And for kestrels, they have this information I just pulled off to show you. And you can go there uh, to those sites. Um, and I can provide these links to people after the talk as well, if you want to have those separate links. In terms of how well the kestrel is doing, um, it is a species of greatest conservation need in 12 of the 14 northeastern states. And when we look at um, where in the country it's declining and not declining, uh, here are the northeastern states um, and then other sections of the country. The only section of the country that's not declining is in the southeast. And there is a resident population in the in parts of the southeast, um, sort of the southern part there. But you can see throughout the rest of the country, populations uh, are in decline for kestrels. Uh, looking at uh, the 2002 to 2006 atlas, breeding bird atlas, that's the second atlas, you can see the distribution um, and kind of up here in the Piedmont where most of most of them were at that time. Uh, looking at changes from the first atlas, though, we can see a uh, number of confirmed, probable, and possible blocks, uh, nesting records, have all, have all declined uh, between the first and second atlas. Looking at additional data uh, from, from a global population estimate of um, about almost 5 million uh, birds. Maryland, it's estimated, has 1,700. 
uh, in the breeding population. And you can see fairly evenly split across uh, Western Maryland, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain area, with most of them uh, being a little bit more in the coastal plain. Uh, but you can see within Maryland, um, over the um, about a 50 year period, we've lost 48% of the population. And this interesting, the BBS half-life, so the breeding bird survey uh, half-life, that, that's an estimate that if the current trends continue, that the kestrel population will, in Maryland will, no, this is actually the population change uh, is throughout the US and it will half itself in 58 years if, if these trends continue as they are. Um, so we can see in the atlas information, the red triangles here indicate losses from the first atlas to the second. In other words, blocks that had breeding evidence in the first atlas but not in the second atlas are shown in these red triangles. And blocks that did not have evidence of breeding in the first, but did in the second are the green circles. And you can see there are a lot more of these red triangles than green circles. And you can see geographically where a lot of that loss occurred. And if you think about where this is, you know, PG County <laughs> here, Charles County, all the areas that are really growing with uh, suburban development um, kind of in the target for that. The breeding bird survey trends throughout the different regions, you can see consistently on, on the decline. Why are kestrels declining? Well, there's, there's really not one single reason, um, but we have, we have a few reasons that are contributing factors. You remember back when West Nile virus made its, made its debut in the US back in 1999, there were a number of different bird species. Uh, kestrels were among those. I think crows were one of the more visible ones that people knew about that really took an initial hit early on. Uh, crows have rebounded, but you know some other species have been a little slower to recover. Um, Cooper's hawks are increasing in a big way. If we look at the change from the 80s to the 2000s between the first and the second breeding bird atlas, basically we had uh, breeding evidence of Cooper's hawks uh, increase by 226%. Uh, I think Cooper's hawks have really taken advantage to urbanization, bird feeders. They seem to like uh, humans, they are not bothered by humans, and you can see where they have grown uh, pretty much all over, but a lot of this uh, in these areas that have been uh, having a lot of urbanization development. And breeding bird survey, you can see it's very good uptick on Cooper's hawks. And yeah, if you didn't notice that, that is a kestrel that this Cooper's hawk is preying on. So yes, they are documented uh, killing kestrels. Uh, pesticides are just not good for anything. Uh, carbifurin, chlorpyrifos, diazinon, um, all are things that affect uh, birds either directly or indirectly, uh, can kill their food resources, and, and if they eat those food resources can lead to poisoning, which is called secondary poisoning of kestrels and other, um, other raptors, including eagles and other hawks. So this is kind of a typical Maryland uh, farm that would be fairly good for kestrels, but these that scene is rapidly being taken over by scenes like this, uh, rapid urbanization in areas where kestrels used to be. Now, interestingly, um, we're seeing a power line right away now uh, in, behind this subdivision. Power line right aways are one area, not just for kestrels, but for shrubland birds that we're really trying to start looking at and working with, with some of these uh, power companies uh, to manage more from a habitat perspective than they have been in the past. And I know that it's happening in a few places and um, 
Yeah, I'm going to talk with uh, Michael here probably later this week or next week about what he's doing in Sligo Creek area with that. So there is hope even in these urban urbanization areas. New Jersey, somebody in New Jersey, I, I, I can't remember the, the name of the group, but they put up um, over 500 Kestrel boxes and documented the nest success, uh, productivity, and not just that, then they analyzed uh, the land use and land cover surrounding the Kestrel boxes. What they found is that almost 50% of successful Kestrel nests nest boxes were in crops and pasture area. That is kind of their preferred and most productive habitat. And you can see residential rural areas, less than 10%, agricultural wetlands, obviously less than 10%. If you have greater than 50% tree canopy cover, uh, crown closure, they don't do very well with that. They need that open area. Other includes uh, other types of grasslands and shrublands and that type of thing. But again, main, main point here, crops and pasture land uh, is what they like. All right, we have our second quiz of the evening for barn owl, uh, Taito Alba. Taito Alba literally means white owl. The Taito is Greek for night owl and the Latin alba means white, which probably describes the pale underparts that make a flying barn owl look ghostly white against the night sky. And if you've ever seen a barn owl flying at night, I think you know exactly what that looks like. Barn, the barn owl is one of the most widely distributed birds. Uh, in the world. And you can see here, it spans virtually every continent uh, except Antarctica uh, throughout the world. Uh, there are 29 recognized subspecies of barn owl. And barn owls are not just uh, good <laughs> for keeping your rodent population, your pest population down in your fields and, and uh, around the barn. But in the Middle East, they actually uh, have been responsible for efforts uh, between Israel and Jordan uh, to create a connection uh, between farmers in those two countries. And here is an example here. of one of the owls. Um, the guy in the background there is Yossi Leshem. Uh, he's probably one of the top ornithologists in Israel. Uh, Tel Aviv University started the Israeli Ornithological Society. Uh, I've had the chance to meet him a couple of times. He is a most engaging person to talk to, has a wonderful sense of humor, can talk forever. <laughs> but he helped, helped get this going on the uh, Israeli side. And I think this was probably what they pointed to as one of the biggest successes of that program is a pair of barn owls got together. The one owl on the left was banded in Israel. The other bird was banded in Jordan. So birds that were reared in different countries actually came together and raised young. Um, and this is one of the farmers whose land that box is on, very happy with what's going on. And to show you how successful this program was and how much attention it got, here is uh, Yossi Lesham and uh, Abu Rashid of Jordan. Those were the two people who really on either side, uh, Israel and Jordan, got this program going, actually had an audience with the Pope, with Pope Francis. And I think you can see here uh, the papal business is probably not usually this happy. So birds can make anybody smile. Looking at barn owls just in the Western hemisphere, um, you can see, again, there are different subspecies, uh, relatively uh, resident populations in South America. And looking throughout the year, starting in January at an animated map, 
Uh, you can see up in North America, just little bits of movement, not really any migration to speak of. Uh, pretty much the same for South America, just little seasonal movements. And that same site, all about barn birdhouses, um, has similar information for barn owls for uh, for nest nest boxes. Looking at populations, um, it's a pretty good global population of 1.8 million birds, is the estimate. In Maryland, it's it's you know if you've ever looked for barn owls, you know it's really hard to do. So barn owls are one of those species that is really difficult to determine its um, population size and therefore population trends. Uh, globally, uh, the lower numbers are least concern. One to five is what these numbers go to. One is the least concern, five being the most. So globally, you can see the population size, PS, the breeding distribution and non-breeding distribution are all really, they're not of any concern. Within the US, the threats to breeding habitat, threats to non-breeding habitat and population trends are kind of right in the middle. Uh, globally, it's estimated that the population is increasing at 50%, which is uh, over 50 years, which is good. In, in the US, um, the Northeast and uh, Midwestern states are really the only places where uh, there's evidence that the, the species is declining. All the other regions in the US, uh, there are no declines being experienced or shown. So one of the problems we have is looking at declining populations of farmland associated birds, um, some threatened and endangered, um, lack of survey data on rare species, and uh, most of the fields that these birds may be in are privately owned. Uh, which makes it more difficult to assess uh, populations. Looking at barn owls within the uh, breeding bird atlas, um, we can see a very spotty distribution, 52 blocks out of uh, this, uh, boy, I forget the number of, of blocks there are, but several thousand. Uh, only 52 blocks had um, evidence of breeding in that last atlas. From the first to the second atlas, it looks like there was significant changes in the distribution, a significant drop. But one thing that needs to be pointed out is in that first atlas in the mid 80s, there was one person who spent a lot of time specifically surveying for barn owls. And in the second atlas, in the early 2000s and mid 2000s, the level of effort looking for barn owls was not as great. So this could be somewhat of an artifact of effort in addition to just uh, population declines. But based on all this data, it looked like there was about a 70% change, negative change in the number of blocks with evidence of barn owls breeding. And fairly evenly distributed throughout the state. So now we're gonna look at uh, the last two species, which are not the primary focus of our um, farmland raptor program. Pennsylvania, uh, actually run by Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, um, I think got really the first farmland raptor program going and uh, they do a lot more with uh, Northern Harrier and short-eared owls, uh, which they have more of those, I think, breeding there than we do. So, Circus Hudsonius. Circus uh, derives from the Greek kirkos, K-I-R-K-O-S, which means a circle. This is a name Aristotle and other classical authors used for a type of hawk. And that name describes the hawk's habit of circling in the sky as it hunts. So that's where circus comes from. Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus, who came up with the uh, current uh, binomial nomenclature system, described this species in 1766 and named it for Hudson Bay, where the type specimen was taken. 
So Circus Hudsonius. Now until 2017, it was considered conspecific, which means it was considered the same species with the hen harrier, which breeds in Eurasia. Hen harrier is now Circus cyaneus. So looking at um, Northern Harriers, there is there are breeding Harriers in Maryland. This is where they they kind of breed in these um, grassy wetland areas, which are typically found um, on the lower eastern shore. And you can see uh, from the second atlas, this is where most of these records of uh, breeding evidence were found, lower eastern shore area, and then a few out um, in western Maryland. And looking at changes from the first to second atlas, um, not not a lot of significant changes, a little bit of movement, uh, maybe as Dorchester County is starting to experience uh, some loss of habitat due to uh, sea level rise, they're shifting around a little bit, uh, but in general, they're, they're fair, staying fairly, fairly stable within the state at this point. Uh, globally, um, 1.6 million birds. It's estimated there are right around 100 um, breeding in, in Maryland. Um, the population trend is the most concerned. It's, it's, it's dropped by about 37%. Uh, but uh, really, well, the threats to breeding and non-breeding habitat, uh, I think in large part, uh, could be linked to climate change and rising sea level. Uh, but breeding distribution and non-breeding distribution are of no concern, and the population size is uh, slightly of concern. Within Maryland, the, the breeding bird survey route, uh, you can see it's up and down, up and down, uh, but fairly, fairly stable trend. Um, and in the U.S., it's fairly stable, slightly declining. So the number here is the number of birds detected uh, per uh, breeding bird survey route. So what you can see here, breeding bird survey probably is not the best way to assess the population of harriers when we're looking at less than half a harrier found on a 50 route uh, breeding bird survey route. And in Maryland, it's even worse. Um, <laughs> we're looking at right around 0 0.025 birds, which, yeah, breeding bird survey isn't really the best math method we have. Looking globally in eBird, uh, from eBird data, what the Harrier uh, does throughout the year, uh, again, you can see in our area, not too much significant. Well, it, there is some movement here. Uh, they do winter here mostly, but, you know, then breeding is they move northward uh, for the most part for breeding. And you can see a little bit of evidence there of breeding uh, from eBird. Moving on to the last species, short-eared owl, Azio flameus. Um, Azio is Latin for a kind of horned owl, and they are very short horns. Um, <laughs> for the short-eared owl. Flameus is Latin for flame-colored or fiery. Uh, perhaps a bit overstated, uh, but probably named after the tawny cinnamon buff coloration. So again, um, short-eared owl habitat, these open grasslands and farm areas. Um, Maryland, um, there was a one uh, record uh, <laughs> of breeding um, indication in uh, Western Maryland. I, I think that might've actually been around Dan's Mountain uh, in the uh, mid 2000s. So obviously we don't really have uh, what you would call a breeding population within Maryland. And um, yeah, as you can see, it was a possible record even. It wasn't, a, they didn't actually get confirmed uh, a record out there for breeding. Globally, 3.3 million birds, um, but looking at a 65% drop in the population uh, since 1970. Um, now, 
again, breeding bird survey is not the best way to sample short-eared owls. You can see here, uh, this is um, in the U.S. that um, you know less than uh, 0.1 birds detected per survey route. Looking at overall trends, um, this orange color means they're pretty much stable, relatively stable as best we can tell. Uh, the blue means there's a slight increase and this uh, orange red is a decrease. Uh, but again, trying to get these trends is, is somewhat problematic. Uh, looking at the year round um, abundance of short-eared owls, you uh, can look on the site and what they do is say certain products may not be available due to insufficient data. Short-eared owl does not have enough data to run one of these uh, animated maps. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to get a good assessment of the population. Um, I wanted to mention this area in red here called the Great Valley of Eastern North America. Um, it, and it has, has always been and continues to stand out as um, a significant area for grassland birds, including barn owls and, and kestrels for that matter. Uh, and there's a continued focus on agriculture uh, in, this, in this Great Valley landscape. So there's really not been a lot of pressure from uh, secondary succession or residential development um, as in many other Eastern landscapes. Uh, so pretty much that landscape has remained stable since before the Civil War. So it's actually good for barn owls, kestrels, other grassland birds uh, in terms of nesting. And I know in, in Virginia, the Virginia Society of Ornithology has a project uh, whoop, for um, looking at putting up kestrel boxes and it's very successful, the success they have with putting up kestrel boxes uh, in this area. And so th this yellow triangle is just to show approximately where Hagerstown, Maryland uh, sits uh, to give you a kind of perspective of, of where this is. And one thing, we, you know, I showed earlier the, the, the one uh, atlas graphic that showed the red triangles kind of in this whole area. Uh, well, when you look at <laughs> the land uses in Maryland, this is um, kind of where we are right now. Uh, with the red being developed land. Uh, agricultural lands, um, Eastern Shore, kind of up in the Piedmont area. Uh, they're somewhat disappearing down here in Southern Maryland. Uh, forested areas you can see really is just a lot of fragmentation of forest areas as, as well right nowadays. So the Farmland Raptor Program uh, is a way for us to stabilize and hopefully begin to increase uh, the farmland raptor populations in Maryland. There are four recovery goals that um, objectives that we have um, uh, for, for these species. First off, we, we really need to do a better job of assessing the population. Uh, we need to monitor nest box productivity where there are nest boxes, uh, just do a better job of trying to uh, find out where these birds are actually breeding. Uh, we want to look at eBird data a, a little more closely uh, just to see um, where kestrels and barn owls in particular are breeding. And then we need to obviously identify and then protect and restore some of the critical habitats that these birds used. As, as we've seen, it's, it's these agricultural, um, grassland, uh, early successional habitats uh, that are disappearing. So um, we need to work with landowners to uh, identify areas that are a priority and uh, help them with nest boxes and understanding the value of their land uh, for these species. We need to increase the availability of nest sites 
uh, natural cavities uh, are something that um, particularly kestrels used uh, in the past. Abandoned buildings and barns, um, also important for, for barn owls. And then we want to look at um, increasing the number of nest boxes that are available uh, for breeding. And that's one of the main things that we will be hoping to get bird clubs um, involved in is uh, helping with uh, raising funds and building, installing and monitoring uh, nest boxes. And of course, then public awareness, uh, just of the, the plight uh, of these birds, the population declines, the benefits of these birds for rodent control. And they, they are in fact phenomenal uh, at rodent control. I think a, a, a pair of barn owls will consume over 3,000 or uh, 3,000 rodents uh, during a nesting season, which is pretty significant. Kestrels are, are uh, just about the same in how many rodents they can take out. The, the concurrent side of that is if you increase the amount of rodent control naturally through these raptors, uh, you should be able to then reduce or eliminate pesticide use, uh, which is potentially a big problem. So just a few pictures in the middle here, you can see um, Calvert County group uh, who's put a barn owl box in uh, uh, one of these um, shoreline wetland areas, which has been very successful. And um, they are helping take the lead on this, on this program with us. So I would now want to just move into chimney swifts also. And um, your last quiz of the day, Kitura pelagica. So Kitura is a, a combination of two ancient Greek words, uh, chaite, chaite, C-H-A-I-T-E, which means bristle or spine and ura, O-U-R-A, which means tail. So if you look here, um, chimney swift and also vox's swift in the West are the two species within Kitura, and they have these bristly spiny tails. Pelagica is derived from the Greek word pelagikos, which means of the sea. Uh, this is really thought to be a reference to its nomadic lifestyle rather than a specific reference to sea. And that theory is strengthened by the later assignment of the specific name Pelasgia after the nomadic Pelasgi tribe of ancient Greece. <laughs> so um, it is really uh, the nomadic bristle tail. Now, just to show you that the best bird experts in the world don't just look at barn owls, but here when Losi Yossi Leshem <laughs> had an audience with the Pope, he presented the Pope with a swift sculpture. So whether that's a justification for us or not, it just shows that barn owls and swifts do need protection <laughs> worldwide. Looking at chimney swift abundance uh, year round, um, they are very nomadic and pretty much leave the US completely. Uh, here's the fall, they're starting to gather up and then they head down and they pretty much head down into the Amazon uh, during the non-breeding season. So very much a long distance migrant species. Population trends for chimney swifts, as, as I mentioned before, they have dropped 67% in the last 50 years. And looking at breeding bird survey trend data, uh, there is no blue. Blue is would be a positive trend. Um, pretty much every breeding bird survey route is showing declines uh, of chimney swifts. Uh, Maryland, you can see it's um, a very steep decline. In the, uh, it's, it's on the red list for the IUCN, uh, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, it, it's at a vulnerable state um, listing in the red list, which is not a good place to be. 
in Maryland, um, almost 100,000 birds is, is uh, the estimate for chimney swifts, most of those in the coastal plain, uh, eastern shore, western shore. Um, the threats to breeding habitat and the population trend, those are the two highest concern, population trend being the highest, five out of five. Threats to breeding habitat. Well, what is the breeding habitat for chimney swifts? It's chimneys. And as you may know, or may not know, uh, new construction is really not incorporating chimneys the way they used to be. Chimney swifts um, do not have, uh, they cannot perch. So their toes are di ah, forget the word again. <laughs> they can only cling. So they need brick chimneys to cling onto. So some of these newer chimneys that are uh, aluminum or metal on the inside do not work for chimney swifts. Some existing chimneys are being capped um, to prevent swifts uh, either intentionally or unintentionally from being able to use them for nesting. Uh, they are fairly widely distributed throughout the state. Um, and you can see throughout the two different breeding bird atlas efforts, there wasn't significant changes and pretty equal increase in blocks and decrease in blocks and where breeding evidence uh, was found. One thing that we are uh, going to work on, um, well, first of all, um, it's important to note that in any given nesting structure, a swift tower or a natural chimney, there is ever only one nesting pair, one breeding pair per chimney. Now, there may be a few other birds that roost there, uh, but there is only ever one breeding pair, no matter how big the structure. And you can see here how they cling uh, with their toes. Um, and the nest is constructed from twigs that are glued together with their saliva, which uh, is an incredibly strong, quick drying uh, glue, if you will. And you can see it's a half cup nest. Uh, <laughs> very interesting process. So another big phenomenon are these pre-migratory roosts. In the fall, after all the, the nesting is done and birds have fledged, the young have fledged, uh, they start to gather in these pre-migratory roosts because they tend to migrate and mass as they head south. And here you can see a smaller chimney, how they're clinging to the side of it. Uh, bigger chimney, this is in Ontario. Um, there are probably a couple thousand birds right here um, gathering together. And if you haven't seen the spectacle of swifts coming into roosts uh, in one of these pre-migratory roosts, it is a most amazing phenomenon. Uh, an amazing spectacle. There are a few large roosts around the area and you need to start looking for this activity late August, mid to late August, and then into September. And at the larger chimneys, you can just see all the swifts go around. It's like a cyclone. They're all going in the same direction. And then all of a sudden one bird will start the process and there will just be this swirling mass. It looks like a tornado just starting to disappear down a chimney. So artificial chimneys are made by uh, building these swift towers. This is uh, one from Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania has built, uh, I think over 150 of these and placed them in their regional parks with extremely good success uh, for nesting. This is a larger chimney on a rooftop uh, that is designed, well, for nesting, but also probably as a pre-migratory roost uh, chimney. So this is the kind of chimney that we are going to start to uh, try to work with groups to build. The Anne Arundel Bird Club is actually in the process of building one of these right now to be placed at Kinder Farm Park. Um, and that hopefully will be up in time for the upcoming nesting season. So our Chimney Swift Conservation Program 
is, is very similar in its purpose and objectives to the Farmland Raptor Program. We want to stabilize and begin to increase chimney swift populations in Maryland. Uh, again, assessing the population, uh, increase the availability of nest sites. Now, this, this is, um, ha has a couple of key factors, one of which is to uh, encourage homeowners to keep existing chimneys uncapped. Uh, and one of the ways we want to try to do that is working with chimney sweep companies uh, so they can be aware of chimney swept chimney swift nest and they don't knock them down during the nesting season and maybe begin to work with them to uncap chimneys um, in the spring, early spring, late winter when they clean the chimney, leave it open and then recap it after the birds are gone. Uh, so it prevents any snow or other uh, things coming in over the winter when they're actually using the chimney. Uh, and then the other is to build these swift towers um, and then monitor the productivity obviously in these towers and then try to find out you know if we can how many birds are nesting actually in um, chimneys in houses or businesses and then the public awareness aspect of it is to really help homeowners understand how important their chimney can be uh, and may already be uh, as well as some small businesses um, chimney swifts provide excellent insect control um, and one of the things uh, that we <laughs> really like to um, get out is the word, both with farmland raptors and with chimney swifts, I think something I might call the cool factor, the coolness factor. Uh, any of these species are just, I think, fun to have around, fun to watch. Um, each has their own unique uh, aspect um, that can endear you to wanting to help uh, provide nesting habitats for those. And some of the uh, the groups that are already working with us uh, for farmland raptors in particular, uh, and also chimney swifts. And um, I want to close just with a couple more things on this seven simple actions. Um, and these again are things like within our Bird City Maryland program and uh, other programs that we are working with. So windows, making windows safer. Um, collisions with windows kill up to a billion birds every year. And it's not skyscrapers, it's primarily houses and uh, small businesses, smaller buildings. Uh, doing the community science. So farmland raptors, chimney swifts, Christmas bird counts, which hopefully some of you uh, got out to do in the last uh, few weeks. Get out an eBird, um, including the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, help us monitor some of these important bird areas, which again, that was delayed last year because of uh, the pandemic, but hopefully this year we'll get back to it. Um, keep your cats indoors. It's healthier for the cats, um, healthier for the birds. Uh, an outdoor cat lifespan is about two to three years. An indoor cat is about 12 to 13. Um, reduce plastics, especially these single-use plastics. Uh, maybe you've all heard that the micro, uh, microplastics are pretty much now found in every human around the globe, even um, native uh, Eskimo tribes that have um, microplastics found in them. Use native plants. Um, looking at pollinators, you know, bees, butterflies, it's better for all of those, less things to mow and water, less fertilizer and pesticide use. Drink shade grown coffee. Um, there are at least 42 species of Orioles, Warblers, Thrushes and others uh, that spend their non-breeding season uh, in and around shade grown coffee farms. If you want good coffee, I can help. <laughs> My shameless plug, we have a partnership with Birds and Beans Coffee. Go to MarylandBirds.org and um, slash coffee, and uh, we can help you with that. And avoid pesticides. Uh, there's been a lot of activity in recent years, uh, just in the last year or two especially, 
uh, with neonicotinoids, uh, chlorpyrifos, and things like that. Um, they're not just bad for birds, they're bad for humans. Um, and rodenticides in particular are bad for farmland raptors, eagles, uh, red tail, red shoulder hawks, all those. So I invite you to help to join us in helping bring back um, populations of Maryland's birds. And with that, I will close and, and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, if people want to unmute and just voice your questions, or if you want to put them in the chat, either way you're comfortable with is fine. Um, I, I have a question. Um, it's Brendina. And um, so I, well, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask. One is, um, are you working with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission to get bird boxes in various areas there? Because um, I work for them and I would love to, to be a little bit more active in that after seeing this presentation. And that's part, part one and part two, um, um, there's a lot of solar talk right now, um, solar everywhere. And of course, I'm all for carbon reduction, but the targets are these open meadow field areas. And they, they are very, um, the, the, um, the solar panels that I'm seeing, they look like from an aerial view, they look like a parking lot. And uh, I don't see how our birds of prey can, can, uh, you know, survive in in these meadow areas that are gonna, are going to be taken over by solar. And I guess I'm just wondering, are, are you working with solar companies? Um, well, what's your thought on 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 that? Also, at this at this point, we are not directly working with solar companies. Um, it, it's something that. I would like to be able to do uh, in the future. Uh, it's mostly just a capacity issue. Um, I am a staff of one and try to get volunteers to help with various things. Um, the, I think one of the reasons I'm not too concerned about the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership working with solar is that there are other groups um, that are advocating for and, and trying to work with solar companies. Um, the whole Charles County thing with Georgetown Solar was, was um, I think that showed that the public response was, was um, swift and, and very large. Um, the one thing that I like to try to promote with solar is to put solar in areas that are already disturbed uh, and there are plenty of those around. Um, there's, you know, I, I don't really see if there's a need to cut down um, interior forest <laughs> or to plow over otherwise good habitat. I think we have enough areas that we can do the solar. And, and I agree, solar is, is important. Um, but just like with uh, wind turbines, um, the siting of it is, is really crucial. Uh, so I, you know, I keep my eyes open for that, but, um, um, and actually I'm going to start working uh, with Audubon Natural Society on um, looking at conservation of open meadows uh, and fields a little more uh, directly here in, in 2021. So, you know, we might get into that, but that's not the, the primary focus of it. In terms of um, the, the national capital um, I can never remember all the names of that, uh, the group that, that you mentioned. Uh, we're, we're not working directly with them in terms of um, getting boxes or materials. So if that's an option, I would love to talk with you um, because that is one of the limiting factors of um, the Farmland Raptor Program is getting uh, the funding for materials for the boxes for all these things. So if there's a way that you can help with that. Um, yeah, if you if you put your contact information uh, somewhere in the chat, maybe um, I could be in touch with you. I work with a wildlife biologist as well. So um, 
you know, we, we put up purple Martin boxes, but that's about it. So it seems like we could do more. Well, I would love to work with you on purple Martins too. Um, yeah, Marsha gave me the okay to, to bring that topic up. Um, I mean, that's another, it, it's technically, it's not a species of greatest conservation need in Maryland, uh, but it is an aerial insectivore. Uh, so it is, it is a species that, uh, one of those that I think we need to start paying attention to now before the populations drop uh, any further. And they, like a lot of these species, readily take to human nesting structures, the gourds or the, or the condos. So, um, oh, let's see, I think I posted something privately. Sorry, let me post my, uh, everyone, there we go. <laughs> okay, I just posted my email in the chat. Um, so, um, I'm working with the town of La Plata um, and La Plata was the first uh, Bird City, Maryland community. They have officially adopted the Purple Martin as their town bird. And they have two um, Purple Martin colonies in town, right in town. And so I'm trying to work with them uh, to do a little bit more, but I would love to put Purple Martin gourds or condos up anywhere else. So yeah, any of that help with Purple Martins, Barnhouse Kestrel boxes, all that stuff, I'd be very happy. And Chimney Swift Towers, if, if you really want to start getting into the good stuff. Uh, Chris, I wanted to ask two questions about, um, yeah, two questions. Uh, and for the others, we're uh, friends of Sligo Creek and some uh, neighbors are working with uh, Pepco and Anacostia Watershed Society to formalize uh, a, re a much a reduced mowing regime in the uh, Paraline Corridor. If we already have uh, a kestrel, we have at least one visiting this winter, spending quite a bit of time and successfully hunting, and uh, at least two uh, breeding seasons uh, in the last 10 years, we've had a breeding pair. If they're already coming, is it a, should we not think of putting up a nest box or can two kestrels share its uh, total of 17 acres, uh, but you know, long and narrow. Um, but because they're already visiting and have, have bred before in the last 10 years, should, should we or shouldn't we think about uh, nest boxes? I, I definitely would think about it and really? put something up. I mean, if they're already successfully nesting, they're, they're obviously finding a cavity somewhere um a nest box it's something they might use it's something that might attract an additional pair hmm. uh so i i don't think it would be detrimental hmm. um of course i can't give you 100 percent guarantee on that but i think it can only help uh, uh, in, uh bring in additional birds could you have more than one breeding pair in a, a, a an area that size that is something I don't want to venture a guess for. I would tend to say yes, but I really don't know. Um, let me let me see if I can find something out on that. Okay. Uh, and I think Marsha was going to give me your email. Yeah, I'll, I'll connect the two of you. Um, Michael, I'll also mention that um, having a nest box, even if they're nesting in a hollow tree now, having a nest box available isn't a bad idea because that tree can come down at any time. Mm -hmm. It happened on a little farm where I used to live in Elkton. I had oh. nesting right behind my house and then the tree came down and that was the end of that. Oh my, okay. Yeah. And you know, if it's roosting in the wintertime too, uh, or the non-breeding season, you know, it's, it's an additional potential roost site uh, for them as well. Chris, are you doing anything with the backyard bird count, which is a great uh, way of getting young people involved? Um, I I make people aware that of when it's happening. Um, I think Maryland Ornithological Society or Patuxent Bird Club or right. uh, I forget. Do you, 
the Audubon chapter. You're still meeting with an Audubon chapter. Prince there, George's right? Audubon and there's Southern Maryland. Audubon, yeah, yeah. Southern so, Maryland Audubon as you know, well. I think, I think those groups um, are better suited to really um, work with people directly on, on the backyard bird count. But, you know, I think that's another one of these community science things that's just phenomenal. Yeah. And as you said, it's, it's a great way to get uh, kids involved and they don't have to go anywhere. Right. They can just do it right out of their backyard. Speaking of siting solar panels, we noticed in Arizona that the bigger parking lots, such as Walmart's, uh, shield the cars from sun with uh, solar panels. Mm -hmm. Maybe an idea that could be adopted here. That would be just phenomenal. And that's, you know, that's the perfect way to do these types of installations, uh, provide a double purpose. Uh, for them. And yeah, if you've ever been to Arizona, you know that parking your car in shade is <laughs> quite a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, can, is it possible to use the, uh, the benefit of kestrels and catching rodents? Uh, uh, could one say that uh, it reduces the spread of Lyme, of the Lyme disease, uh, the white-footed mouse to the deer, to the humans? Is that, uh, would that be going too far? I think that might be going too far. Um, it might not be, but I, I have not ever come across anything published that links mm -hmm. kestrels or barn owls to reducing uh, tick-borne diseases. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, maybe nobody's really even studied it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, just promoting the fact that they are pretty ravenous in um, reducing rodents is, is a pretty good selling point. Right. The other thing might be <laughs> deer control <laughs> in yeah. terms of the tick-borne diseases, but that's, oh, yeah. that's another person, another presentation to you guys. <laughs> Chris, I, I mentioned something for the uh, spring issue of Maryland Bird Life. Uh, Jill and Lance Morrow that live in Virginia and have done lots of work with kestrels. Uh, they have a, an in-depth article that will be in there uh, on kestrel productivity and a multi-year study. I think it's by 15 or 18 years of work with nest boxes in the Shenandoah Valley. And that'll be- So that's in that Great Valley area, yeah. Yeah, so that'll be in the yeah. spring issue of Maryland Bird Life. Wow. That's good. That's good. I'll look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have wanted to get in touch with them because I know it's been a real successful venture that they've, they've had with that. I was in April. Will that come out in April or when? Probably May. May. It'll probably be out in May. For the chimney swift nests, I was surprised how small those uh, chimneys that people are putting up in parks are. So there's no, uh, there's no ch household chimneys are not too small for, for nests? No. Um, in fact, I think the dimensions, um, and you know, if, if, if you're really interested in chimney swifts, I got these two books uh, from Paul and Georgine Kyle in Texas. They're kind of the authorities on chimney swifts. Um, and this one um, really is, is, has all the information on the plans, construction plans for that. And I think it's like 12, 12 by 12 inches on the inside. Um, I tried to tech to um, write to you guys in the chat, but I guess you didn't see it. Cause oh. I was, my microphone wasn't working. Um, Bowie has two active chimney swift roosts that we used to go and watch when they would come. One is in the old Ken Hill city office building. There's a big old chimney on it. I guess it used to be an elementary school a long time ago. And the okay. chimney swifts roost in there. What was that also building? a place called Red Chimney Farm oh. that is just a chimney, no more farm. Great. And the chimney swifts used to net roost there. Okay. And I just was thinking it would be very cool if um, the Tucson Bird Club and Prince George's Audubon at one of, they could work with um, Prince George's Park and Planning, maybe at um, Governor's Bridge Natural Area or someplace close to those other roosts and put up a chimney, sponsor a chimney swift bar, um, tower. 
That'd be great. Yeah. What was that? The... Will they come from an old chimney and come into a new one? Is there any studies on that? Well, they'll they'll go to you know if if they're successful, in, like many birds, if if they have success and fledge young, um, and they generally come back to the area, they'll oftentimes use that same nesting structure uh, because it was successful. Um, however, one thing we want to do is provide additional nesting structures to help additional birds. So if there is a successful nesting pair in that thing, then that probably have a fair to good chance of um, attracting an additional pair. Chris, my understanding is that the artificial nest structures, like you're putting up a kinder farm park, they're not for roosting, they're for nesting. Is that right? Primarily for nesting. Mm -hmm. um, now they, um, even those and, and regular chimneys can have two, three, maybe even four birds roosting, non-breeding uh -huh. birds, uh, kind of roosting in it during the nesting season. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there may be a number of birds that, that roost in a smaller chimney before they kind of head over to a larger chimney. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think in Bowie we have um, chimney swifts nesting in Old Town Bowie in Old Chimneys. Okay. Yes. And then also in some of the older farmhouses around here. Okay. They'll have open chimneys. Okay. My that's, impression. That's good to know. Like along one, Bell Station Road, I think they nest. What, that's the what place I was the, talking uh, about. The one it's called Red Chimney Farm is on Bell Station Road. And Lisa, what was the, the first building you were talking the about? Ken Hill. It used to be the um city office building. It still is. It's on Ken Hill Drive in Bowie. It's an old elementary school that's now used for city offices. Ken Hill Center. Ken Hill Center. Mm -hmm. Candle Center, yes, okay. and it has a big chimney on it. Nice. Okay. So one one of the things I want to do is is have a brochure. We do have a brochure for the Farmland Raptor Program um, that um, Southern Maryland Audubon actually paid for, but it's uh, like a trifold thing that we want to get out to farmers and other landowners uh, that that have potential um, nesting habitat that we can put boxes up. Uh, for that. I want to do something similar for chimney swifts, um, especially in areas where they are nesting in houses or buildings, uh, just to give something to give to the people like in control of that chimney to let them know, we know there's chimneys there and we want them to know how good they are uh, to help not just, you know, so they understand that there is something there that's good and it's not going to be a bad thing because um, a lot of people hear the <clears throat> baby chimney swifts can really sound like banshees um, and scare they scare some people <laughs> so they don't they don't want to hear that noise but it's it's only until they fledge um, and we just want to let people know it's not a banshee it's it's actually a, a good thing <laughs> so I I might be able to work with you guys and have you know have you start to get this out to, to places that you know have chimneys or swifts nesting in in chimneys, which would be great. Chris, um, Brandina in the chat asked a question about cleaning and maintaining nest boxes. Yeah, now you know I've talked with the people in. Um, Audubon, Western Pennsylvania, since they've done so many of them, and they, and they say, you know, generally you don't really even need to clean them out because um, if there's an old nest there, and the, and these things you build are somewhat open at the bottom, so things can fall out, but these nests tend to disintegrate over time mm -hmm. and just break off, um, but they'll always build a new nest on that, so even if there is an old one, it, it it won't matter and uh, generally there's no health issues for the birds uh, with that and and in human chimneys <laughs> I'd say uh, that's where chimney sweeps um, we want to work with chimney sweep company because they'll sometimes people call them to clean their chimneys during the nesting season and some of them just knock down existing active nests which you know they obviously a violation of migratory bird treaty act but 
uh, it's also something that doesn't have to happen. And it's just the timing, like a lot of things, the timing of when something is done can have a huge impact. So there are several avenues we want to work with um, regarding chimney swifts nesting in chimney structures already there with houses and, and small businesses. And what about um, Kestrel and Al boxes? What's the procedure for them? Yeah, I think, I think in general, it's probably helpful to, to clean those out. Um, and that's one thing I'm working um, with the, well, we have a small committee um, for farmland raptors and we're, we're going to be putting together sort of a guide on um, how, you know, how to, what plans to use to build a nest or box, how to monitor the box, how to enter your data, and then how to maintain the box, uh, including cleaning it out and um, getting it ready for the next season. Can you just say a, a few words about um, nest boxes, since we're talking about nest boxes, talk about maintenance of um, nest boxes that people commonly use for smaller songbirds like chickadees and wrens and so on, bluebirds. Yeah, so, you know, in general, it's just, it's just a good thing to clean out those smaller nest boxes um, because a bird will build a new nest every year regardless. If there's something in there, they'll build on top of it. Um, with the smaller birds, there's a lot, it's a smaller box and there's a, a, I think an increased chance of parasites and other things that can be harmful to the birds or to nestlings. So, and some people go as far as you know, even disinfecting uh, the inside, but you got to be really careful with that, that if you do disinfect it, you got to really clean it out. So none of that's left because that can be harmful as well. But cleaning out the old nest is, is a good thing. Um, it's not going to slow the bird down. They're going to build a nest regardless. And uh, especially some of these boxes, when I used to monitor, uh, I think it was like 40 boxes this one lady had in her, in her farm, um, you know, certain areas, the, uh, uh, the house wrens just love to take over the box and they just flutter with sticks. It's like, I don't know how they got in there, but you know, you clean that out because maybe it'll be a bluebird next year instead of the house wren, although it never was. Um, but yeah, just cleaning them out's good. Well, perhaps that's all of our questions. Does anybody have another question? Yeah, Gorman wrote, uh, actually, Chris, I'm sorry. No, I I I, uh, I remember seeing somewhere, <laughs> sorry, that there exists a kind of caps uh, for chimneys with a slit in the center, and apparently the birds know how to go through that. But it does cap the chimney to some to some degree for people who are worried about I don't know some other type of bird coming. Is is that do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I've I've not heard of that. Um... Yeah. I, 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 yeah. All right, I'm writing this down. The I think one of the main concerns people have uh, for critters getting in are raccoons and squirrels. Um, so something with a small yeah. cap would probably well prevent raccoons. I don't know about squirrels, but um, I think raccoons are probably the more notorious ones for trying to get in and. They're, they're just curious things. Chris, are you working with people at the Gorman Road CSA? No. Okay, well, great. Well, I'll find you and we'll, we'll see if we can connect you with someone there. It's a large operation, really. Gorman Road? CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. Oh, and, yeah. Um, okay. That, That'd be great. Yeah. Where's, where's Gorman Road? In Laurel. Um, It, 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 it's 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 um, um, quite a bit of acreage. The Gould family, I think, owned owned and still owns quite a lot of the land. And um, uh, that'd be a good place for yeah yeah putting up Kestrel box probably. Yeah, the the beekeeper there actually is a good guy to know. Okay, good, excellent. Yeah, and I I did post my email in the chat. Uh, and if you go to our website, um, 
yeah, marylandbirds.org. Um, you can go to the contact page and send a message with that too. I'll uh, be glad to talk to anybody about additional questions or opportunities to collaborate. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. We very much enjoyed your talk. We learned a lot from you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. It's always, and, always good to talk to enthusiastic people. Uh-huh. And best wishes with the programs that Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership is undertaking. Thank you. Wish you well. All thank right. You, Chris. Some people are going to be in touch with you about specifics. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody. Thank you, Marcia. Stay, stay safe. Take care. Thank you. You too. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia, and everyone else. Bye bye. Bye bye. Nice to see you all. Oh, how do I?